world The weather outside is not that cold And if you take my hand, I'll walk with you to Georgia Hello and welcome to Country with Celine. I'm your host, Celine Chamarki, and today I'm so excited to announce our guest. He's got a total of 100 million streams. Uh, he was named one of Entertainment Weekly's five artists, Break Now, and Rolling Stone's Country's One to Watch. So please welcome Levi Hummins. today what's up and hello from nashville tennessee i am so thankful to be on this podcast and just uh thanks for inviting me to do this oh awesome thanks levi um so first things first let's talk your latest ep so 36 slash 86 did i say that correctly yeah. okay Actually, 36 86 but yeah oh. that's right okay 36 86 my apologies so how did you come up with the name i'm just curious about that yeah, so 3686 is like the longitude and latitude of Nashville. Um, so it's, it's a longer number, but 3686 is a short one. Um, and uh, Nashville's my hometown. So I wanted to put together a little project, especially during COVID, um, that was just a ton of music. Um, everything from Good Taste to Wedding Dress, which are two of my favorite new singles. Um, and then some other songs that I, I wrote with both my dad and just friends around town. Um, and the project itself is just... It's just an example of all my songwriting. Um, it's really, really poppy to really organic and kind of Americana roots. Yeah. Um, and I think it showcases kind of who I am as a listener and also as a writer. So I was really hope, happy to put that out, especially when there wasn't any touring and just fans could digest it. You just answered my second question. It was pretty much going to be what was the goal and the story behind this EP? And thank you for answering it anyways within the first one. Yeah, it was awesome. Your the album, the EP that you just released, I loved it. But I have to talk about Wedding Dress because I know that was a single that you released last year and now it's on the EP this year. That right. song is just making like circulation all on TikTok. Like I'll be scrolling my feed and then that song just pops up. So how does it feel knowing that Wedding Dress is ultimately a first dance song and a TikTok famous song now. No, it's crazy. I think, um, so we released the song in 2020 and we had all these plans for the song because it's called Wedding Dress and we're like, this is going to be this wedding song of 2020. Uh, we were, I think we were, put it out in March or, or February, something like around there, early that year. Mm -hmm. um, and it just started crushing. We we're on like a hot country playlist on Spotify and it had almost like 8 million streams. It was just crushing it. And then COVID hit and then weddings got canceled. Yeah. So we were like, <laughs> the wedding season that never happened. Um, but uh, the song, like, so my dad's a songwriter here in town as well. And he wrote a song called Bless the Broken Road. And um, he basically told me that wedding songs are songs that kind of never end. Uh, if you write a wedding song, it kind of lives on forever. So people are always going to be getting married. And so if you put something out in the world that people love and can relate to in their weddings, that it's going to have another life and it's going to have a lot of lives. And so right now I'm kind of like, I've released it in 2020, but it feels still brand new because people are hearing it and playing it for the first time. I know I'm not some perfect man. Got too many flaws to count on both of my hands. You rest your head down on my hand-me-down suit. I see that bright. Wedding songs are iconic. They never, ever go out. You can have a wedding song from like the 1950s and like played in like 2024 and it will still right. hit the same exact way. So you're following in your father's footsteps. That's awesome. And bless the broken road. Like that's top notch. Like I can't even like that's top notch. The Rascal Flats are amazing like themselves like eh. how, wait I want to ask since we're on this topic how did that happen like did Rascal Flats reach out to your dad and like ask him to write this or was it a song he already wrote and released and they asked to cover it how, how did it happen yeah so my dad actually um wrote the song with a guy named Jeff Hanna of the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band 
Uh, they had that famous song, Fishing in the Dark. Um, my dad did not write that song, but he wrote Blessed Broken Road with Jeff Hanna um, back in like 1990 something. And it took almost, I think, 10, 15 years for the Rascal Flats to record that song. Um, in 2006, it went number one. And then now it's just, you know, the Rascal Flat song, but it's lived a bunch of different lives. I think it had a number one in Christian radio too, with another artist. And so it's just have a, had a, a ton of different lives and been recorded by a ton of different artists. That's an amazing accomplishment too. Like yeah. that, wow, congratulations to your dad. And you're following in his footsteps, like I said. So who knows with Wedding Dress, maybe that will be the next big song that everyone will be playing at their weddings. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because we did this thing in Nashville. So Nashville's like the capital of the bachelorette parties right now. And uh, just as kind of the world was reopening, I, I reached out on my Instagram. I said, does anybody have a bachelorette party that they want me to surprise here in Nashville? And we got like 400 people like responding. And we're like, please come out, do this, this, and this. Um, ended up reaching out to this bachelorette group and they surprised the bachelorette, the bride. And she invited me out to do like her first dance at her wedding in August. So we're going out there. To, it's like a thing in Denver. And we're going to go, su not surprise her, but perform for her first dance with her uh, husband. That's awesome. Oh, my God. You must get nervous, though. Like, because you feel like, don't you feel like you have to be on your A game when like that happens? Especially for a first dance, you're performing your song. Yeah, this will be my second wedding performance, but my first first dance. So... I have yet to tell you. I'll let you know how it goes. <laughs> yeah, I would love to hear. I think you need to come, like, once I get, you know, like, there's nothing on my finger right now. But maybe one day when that happens, you got to come to my wedding. <laughs> well, yeah, I hope if you want the wedding dress, um, let me know, and I'll be there up in Canada. Oh, yeah. the destination is. Up in Toronto, you know, because we're up here in Canada, but we're still under lockdown, but we're living life still. We're still trying to get by. Um, and now I want to also touch on, you recently posted a clip on your Instagram, and it was this song that you didn't release yet. It's unreleased, and it's right. called Miss LA, and you wrote that yeah. about your girlfriend, Dallas. So she's a lot of your, that's where a lot of your inspiration comes from, like, especially yeah. with the song, I'm assuming, Wedding Dress, of course, um, and Good Taste, and A Home. So can you please tell us, how did you two meet? Yeah, so she also might walk here and at, at any moment. She might walk in the, in the room, so... <laughs> Uh, me and her, so I was going through a breakup right as COVID hit and I had never been on a dating app in my entire life. Uh, but it was COVID and I wasn't meeting anybody. So I just was like, screw it. I'm joining a dating app, uh, joined a dating app called Raya and Dallas was the first girl I matched with the first girl I messaged the first girl I FaceTimed and then eventually the first girl I met in real life. Um, and I picked her up from the Nashville airport cause she was living out in LA and was going to move to Nashville anyways. But she ended up uh, coming out here to Nashville for 10 days just to see if she liked it. And the rest is history. She like moved here about a month later. And, um, and then now we've been living together for about a month and a half. And it's been, it's been quick, but also COVID pushes you to date really fast. And we just like, we're like in each other's lives immediately. Um, I think one of our first dates was just like, my parents live here like two or three miles away. And we went over to their pool. And so she met my parents like for like the second or third date. And um, it all moved really fast, but you know, me and Dallas, it's, she's totally inspiring. And she's her own kind of boss. So she like does her own complete thing. And I'm just like a fan of her as much as she's a fan of me, which is, is pretty incredible. I love that. She's a boss lady. She's an independent boss lady. Yep. You got to give it up to females like that. Um, but that's so sweet. So your love story, it really seems like you guys have known each other for like quite a long time and it's only been what, a year? Like a year? Would it be it, this year in June? Well, the officially, I think it's like a year and three months in a couple days. So it's been, uh, it's been incredible. No, I feel it's one of those things like when you meet the person that, you know, probably is going to be the person for the rest of your life. It's like, it's everything is new and old all at the same time. And you just kind of take it for how it, how it is. And you just thank God, honestly. This LA, I know you used to be up below the sun he's 75 that's why you feel a little low when it rains when it pours when the colors seem faded it's not the same as before but i think we're gonna make it most of you is happy that you left the place part of you is thinking oh what a waste i know some of Still dreaming about them sunshine days So I don't really blame you if you miss LA, miss LA.
and there's no time frame but like if you meet someone and you have that instant connection and you just know and it's just you, you can't control it. it it just flows so naturally and you guys want to get closer and closer then now you guys are living together that's adorable but so miss ellie when's it going to be released so i just signed a brand new publishing deal which is like means getting paid to write songs pretty much um and i think i've written maybe eight or nine of my favorite songs i've ever written um miss la is up there but i have a new song that's coming out very very soon i can't really say anything else but it's definitely like my favorite song i've like ever written up to this point um and i'm gonna be releasing it this summer just in time for touring so oh. I, uh i can't even i get to actually you're the first person i'm telling you this but i'm actually featuring an artist as well so it's gonna be a fun little project wow so you heard it here first on country with sleet i'm honored thank you levi of course um just i want to ask is it maybe like love before you is that like because i saw your TikTok and i saw you put that song could it possibly well, no not no. until i have <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's actually i will tell you this it's a song i haven't even teased yet at all oh um, but all those songs i i think i really like um how i kind of operate just in general is like i don't really hold anything back like i will tease songs and stuff like that but um for the most part, I like just kind of getting re people's reactions uh, because a song itself like will change in the recording process and it will be kind of completely different by the time it comes out. Uh, but getting people's feedback is really important to me. And then especially like before TikTok, it was going on the road and performing these songs live. Um, and for me, that was a really honest way to uh, get people's just like feedback and reaction. And there's no more honest way to like figure out people like a song than playing it for them face to face and seeing if they don't look at their phone or not. Of course. Well, that was prior to COVID how like songs would get teased and stuff. But since right. COVID, everyone's been cooped up in their houses. So, I mean, thank God for TikTok because TikTok really like just took off as soon as the whole pandemic happened and the lockdowns and the quarantine. So that was the real way that you could actually tease music. And a lot of artists utilize that, which is so smart because like you're saying, it, it's pretty much the same thing as if you were in front of a live crowd, just you don't see the feedback, like see right. physically, but like you can read it and you still know like where their head is at with these songs. Speaking of TikTok, I've like accidentally made my dad famous on TikTok, which has been kind of a wild experience. <laughs> I was scrolling. I noticed that I'm like every other video was you saying, "Hey, Dad, sing that song that you wrote." Hey, Dad, sing that. I'm like, that's so cute, though. This so I I did like what was it? I had I had a few like videos in a row where I started like just like talking to my dad in the video, and then it just started blowing up. So I was like, I'm just gonna keep doing this over and over until it just like stops blowing up. And then every single video got more and more views. And like by the end of it, I had like one with like 1.1 million views, and it was like insane. I was like. <laughs> My dad is, gets more reactions on TikTok than I do, and he's 60 years old. I feel like that's always how it is. It's the older people that you take a video of them, and that video will blow up. But something that you actually tried so hard to, like, make popular just right. dies. Like, it's, like, it's so fun, though, to, like, be able to, like, have those, like, even moments with my dad where I just get to go over to the, my parents' house and, like, make a fun video with him. And he loves it, like, legitimately – like he's now the one that's like, Hey, I got this cool idea for TikTok where we do this, this, and this. I'm like, dad, please. I, I literally can't even like, you need to start your own TikTok because this is getting too much. I was just going to say, I think he needs to start his own. He'll be more popular than you by the end of it. It's a hundred percent true. It's, it's going to be so sad. I, I put so much effort in and he's just going to be like one video. Boom. What one shot wonder. One <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so speaking of the tour, Let's give like the viewers, do you have like any dates or like where exactly in the States you're going to be performing? Are you going to come to like maybe Canada? Like who, what's going on? If Canada ever opens back up, that'd be amazing. Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> uh, I love Canada. I've actually done a few shows up in Toronto. Um, and then oh, I've done a bunch. Uh, I mean, I love, I think Canada's one of my favorite places. We did Boots and Hearts um, a couple times, which is unreal. Um, but no, our, our big plan is just, I can't really say anything again because it's all about to be announced, but we're going to tour the entire United States this fall pretty much. Um, and then I have one thing I just announced, which is a big festival up in New Jersey. Uh, it's the same night as like Dan and Shay. So it's, I think me, Chris Lane and Dan and Shay that night. So that's my first show back. Wow. Those are really three good headliners to be up yep. on. Well, it's going to be a really good show. I wish I could come down and watch that, but. 
Canada and the quarantine and oh god it's a mess but anyways let's get to know you even a bit more you said you grew up in Nashville so can you like explain your childhood like where exactly in Nashville like how you got to where you are today yeah um so I grew up in Nashville my dad's a songwriter he wrote songs like Bless a Broken Road Cowboy Take Me Away Born to Fly ton of hits um, and then my mom's a preacher, and she started an organization called Thistle Farms, which helps women with a history of drug abuse and prostitution get off the streets and start their lives anew. And she was CNN Hero of the Year back in 2016 and just is an incredible rock star herself. Um, but I grew up in that family. I grew up uh, literally like waking up at seven in the morning to my dad playing piano and writing songs with, you know, every single artist under the moon. And, um, so I, I always loved music and I always wanted to do music and it was always kind of like a hobby for me. Um, but I never really pursued it until college, I think. Yeah, it was like my sophomore year of college, I was down in Florida and was sending songs back to Nashville, my hometown and saying like, dad, what should I do with this? Where should I go? And he was like, just come back home. And so I ended up coming back home and pursuing music. And it was like, I think three or four months in, I got my first publishing deal signed my first record deal and then basically just sat there and I was like everything happened really fast at first and then kind of slowed down really fast um so instead of just kind of like being like what do I do next I decided to, to do the, the path of the artist as an independent artist and start releasing music and so then the past four years I've been putting out music by myself uh, with my managers and we've accumulated over 100 million streams uh throughout all like the digital releasing Spotify, Amazon, Apple Music, all that great stuff. And then we also got to tour and open up for Keith Urban, Lady A, um, who else? Alabama, Sam Hunt, Martina McBride, every artist. I mean, it was been incredible getting to tour with all these people. And um, yeah, so we ended 2019 headlining my first ever headlining tour, which was just incredible. And then COVID shut the world down. And then now I'm planning on coming back out and just rocking. So how, how was that experience? What did you learn from those acts? Like Keith Urban, like, I'm a huge fan. And Tim McGraw, I also was reading it. Lady Antipas, like, how, how yeah. was that experience? Honestly, it was incredible. I mean, I don't really know how to put it into words. Like, I really, really look up to Keith Urban and Tim McGraw especially. And um, one, it's just amazing getting to step on a stage where there's 30,000 people there and you're just like, oh my God, <laughs> there's so many people here. This is amazing. Um, but the other part that's amazing is, um, just getting to like meet your heroes and getting to like talk to them backstage. I mean, that's like the most incredible part of those moments is like sitting there talking to Tim McGraw backstage and just getting to know him as a human being. Um, and so those are things like you never, you'll get, I'll get to tell my kids that. And, um, it's just things you never forget. You'll never, ever forget that. That's such a memory. That's such a that's such a grateful moment too, like to be in it and to experience all of that. And Tim McGraw, like you wrote a song and he actually cut the song and it was not from California. Right. So, like that's unbelievable. I want to say congratulations for that because if he was an idol of yours, then right. like how the world works. Am I right? No, I think, I mean, that's definitely a dream cut for me is, uh, so I actually wrote this song called not from California um, it was with the Warden brothers and Mick V and then my dad stepped in to help as well. And, um, we wrote the song, recorded it, sent it to Tim and Tim, I guess re responded. was like, I love this song. I want to put it out. How can I do this? And then we heard nothing for like three or four months. Um, and then I got to open up for him in Michigan in like August of 2019. And I'm not even kidding. I walked off stage and Tim McGraw like pulled me aside and he's like, Hey, I just want to tell you something. We just cut not from California. And he started like literally singing the song to me um, backstage. And he was like, it's going to come out on my next record called here on earth. And I just want you to know, I'm so excited about that song and like what an amazing song it is. And <laughs> I'm not kidding. It was like, I literally like walked off stage, like, uh, like just shaking. I was so, so excited and so happy. Um, and then I saw Tim again at the Opry and he played me the song and it was just in incredible, seriously. It's like a fangirling moment or a fanboying moment. Like, that's yeah. so surreal. Um, and now, Tim McGraw. Wait, now I lost my train of thought. A few moments later. Oh my gosh, hold on. Moments later. I was gonna, oh my God, I forgot.
forgot what the question was I was going to ask. More moments later. Talking about Tim McGraw, Opry, backstage, life. I can't remember. Much, much later. Okay, well, that one slipped my mind. If it comes back, then I'll mention it. Um, <laughs> so sorry about that one. Um, I think I was just so starstruck that I just, just forgot as well. We used to try being the artist backstage, talking to Tim and having like all these things you want to say, and then he drops it on you and you're just like, that. <laughs> I was just like, thanks, I don't know. He also <laughs> said like the most random thing to me, and I hope he hears this one day. I bet he'll laugh about it. Um, but he, I had my gold chain on. I always wear this like little gold chain. It's like super thin. Mm -hmm. And he was like, that's a, like a really cute gold chain. And he's like, you want to see my gold chain? And I was like, sure, Tim McGraw. And then he pulls out this gold chain that's like this thick. And it's like around his neck. And he goes, yeah, Faith Hill gave this to me. Everything's bigger when you get hits. And then I just walked away. That was the last thing he said to me. I was like, what just, I, my drummer was right there. I was like, what just happened? Like, honest to God, what just happened? Oh my god, I love it. Yeah, that chain is probably worth like a house. <laughs> <That's Yeah. real. laughs> Pretty baller. Eventually. So now I, I remembered what I was going to say. Um, and I'm pretty sure a lot of people are going to want to know how this all happened. So yeah. go and open for a singer, like like Keith Urban or Tim, like whoever the singer may be. How does that happen? Does like your manager, do they like reach out to your manager and let you know about this? Or, or do you reach yeah. out? How does it happen? So I'm blessed to have an amazing booking agent. Um, it's under CAA, which is Creative Artist Agency. And my agent is a guy named Darren Murphy, who also represents Keith Urban, Darius Rucker, all these amazing artists. And so, um, one, you got to have amazing songs and they got to like you. Their, their whole team has to like you and invite you out. And then it, it goes through Darren and my agency. So I'm super blessed to have an amazing, amazing agent, but it also comes directly from the artist. So the artist has to say yes to you. Um, cause everybody wants those spots. I mean, like every single artist that's, mm -hmm. I mean, everybody wants to go open for Tim McGraw and Lady A and all these people. So it's just a blessing when it happens. And the only thing you can do is go work your butt off. Um, and then go gain as much fans from them as you can, because that's the goal is like, you're, you're in front of 30,000 people and you know, my goal is to eventually be headlining that same show. So how can I get to that spot? How can I start um, growing my fan base in that direction? Yeah, that's such a great platform too. like to perform in front of 30,000 or 40,000, whatever, how many, however many people there are, because they're there for the headliners. Yes, but you're the opening act. So they're most likely going to either sit and watch your act or they're going to walk away. So you want to keep them entertained. And that's, that's how I even became fans of other um, country singers or other like pop artists from the opening acts, because it really shows like a lot. And you, you right. start to really like their music from that moment. Cause you can may never have heard of them. And then you hear them and you're like, wow. And then there's another fan, you know? So every single time I like ever open up for an artist, I go out to the merch table and um like go sit there and just sign autographs until i can't sign anymore or take photos until they go on stage however at the keith urban show i played my show and i was direct support for keith so he was on right after me mm -hmm. and i went out to the merch table and got actually like just mobbed by people and i was like <laughs> all right maybe this isn't the best idea i gotta have a more like better plan for this one because it was like twenty thousand people just like encircling me and that's when like, you start to outgrow stuff. Pardon? I was like, I kind of outgrew that that process at that show. Yeah, that's that's nuts. Um, that's when you know you even like you made it. Like you, and it's, you know that like saying like when you know like you made it. Like that's how you know you made it. It's like a Keith Urban. Like if I saw Keith Urban like by a Murphy, I would go and attack him. Let's be honest. Yeah. I yeah, it was uh when it starts to feel unsafe at the merch tables when you kind of need to readjust. Yeah, yeah. Could you imagine Justin Bieber? Like, cause he's like one of the biggest like stars out there right now. Even Drake or The Weeknd. Like, right. so I could never like. I feel like I'd get claustrophobic if that ever happened. But it's so such a grateful feeling at the same time. Yeah. They just want to be near you. They just want to like that piece of you in a way. And on my end, I just want to sell merch too. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you still did that. I'm sure you still did all of that. Um, That's why I was good. 
<laughs> Levi, before I let you go, we're going to play a little game I like to call Country with Celine Rapid Fire. Um, but instead of asking like this or that questions, I thought I'd ask more like kind of personal questions so the listeners and your fans can actually get to know you even more. Um, so the first one is, what is your biggest fear? Hmm. My biggest fear actually is heights and broken glass. <laughs> totally <laughs> random. But also, I don't, I don't know. I'm actually like not that like scared of stuff like I don't know if that makes sense but no. I don't really have fears in music or something like that so my answer would be like heights is actually my biggest fear okay mine is snakes <laughs> oh, no chance um what is the your biggest accomplishment hmm I feel like there's a lot I I think most recently I'm like happy about the Tim McGraw cut. I'm happy about all these amazing touring opportunities. Um, but I think my biggest accomplishment is the songs I'm about to put out next because I think they're just the best so far. And I think that um, we're just really getting started. So this is gonna be amazing to see what happens next. I'm really excited. Um, and your most embarrassing moment. Oh my God. <laughs> Oh, there's a lot? Is there a lot, Levi? <laughs> oh, there's a lot of really, really embarrassing moments. Uh, a particularly embarrassing moment was, I'm thinking if I'm allowed to say this. <laughs> you can say it, honestly. We're a chill show here. You can say I, anything. Well, there was just a, a show that I went and played in, uh, in, where was it? It was in the middle of like Macon, Georgia, in the middle of Georgia, and I like walked on stage and this guy just shouted out, F you, Justin Bieber, like, as I walked on stage. And I was like, I was like, what? Like, why would you say that? And this dude was, like, heckling me the entire time. So, like, midway through my set, I, um, I like, jokingly, I was like, hey, dude's girlfriend who's, like, been, like, hassling me this entire time, this song is for you. And it was a song called She's Beautiful. And the dude freaking took a beer and threw the beer from like the fifth row all the way up and just smashed into me and like exploded all over me. And I was like, I kind of deserve that one. <laughs> Thinking back to that. That's uh, funny. That's actually really funny. But yeah, the best part was that, so the dude threw the beer and I watched a security guard come from side stage and just annihilate him, just like completely tackle him and just drop him to the floor, which was pretty awesome too. Well, the dude deserved that one, okay, for throwing that. He's probably so like, he had so many beers in. That <laughs> You even know what was really going on. I saw your TikTok video when someone chirped you and then yeah. you really chirped them back, writing that like snazzy little song. And then the ending was just like F you. I'm like, I love this. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. That was more just for fun. I'm not actually like, I, I think it's so, when people are like haters on the internet, to me, I just think it's like funny. And it's also like, if they're hating you on the internet, that means that the song, or whatever the video is, is doing well enough that it's getting to people that don't like you. So that means that's doing well. So I always take that as like a compliment. It is, it is. I feel like there's a saying there, but I can't think of what the saying is. Like the haters, what's that? You you know what, that haters? There's one, there's one from that movie called They Hate Us Cause They Ain't Us. That's it, that's it, yeah. That's yeah. true, they hate us cause they ain't us, you know? Yeah. Um, and the last one is, if you could go back and talk to your younger self, what advice would you give him? <sighs> so much advice, because I'm actually, I don't know when this is going to air, but I'm turning 30 on July 1st, which is in two oh, days. It's going to air before that, don't worry. <laughs> so I, uh, I have a lot of things to tell my younger self. Um, but I think what I, because I've been thinking about this actually a lot this week, is just slow down and like everything is going to happen to you that you want to happen. And, um, cause you know, I'm really, I think my best quality is I'm a hard worker. So I'll work my butt off and I'll just work till I drop. But I, I think for a long time, I just worked and worked and worked and never slowed down, never kind of like sat there and was like, thank you God for this opportunity. Thank you world for this. And just like got to live in a moment. And so I've been, really blessed with 2020 taught me how to kind of live in a moment a little better. And so as I go forward, I'm going to keep telling myself just to like take a deep breath and just like be thankful and just try to like, when something great happens, just don't worry about what's next. That's something that we all really learn from the whole 2020 COVID year was to just be present and live in the moment. Cause 
we were always go, 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 like don't stop, keep going, work this, like do that. We never actually took care of ourselves and we never actually lived in the present moment because we were just so focused on our future, our career, our life. And so having all that time, like it's like 300 days, probably almost a year, exactly. Right. By staying home all the time, we really learned to live in the moment. And I like how you said that you would tell your younger self to do that because that's exactly what I would tell my younger self too. But it's so hard at the same time, but you just got to try your best to just enjoy all the little things and enjoy the moment. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Well, Levi, thank you so much for joining me today. I also have one more thing to mention because it's huge. I was on Spotify and your song from 2017, Stupid, has over 20 million streams. That is a huge accomplishment. So congratulations for that. That's awesome. Guys, if you haven't checked out Stupid, you need to go check that song out now. That was my jam in 2017. But you guys even have to check out his latest EP, 3686. I said it correctly that time. Yep. Uh, all the new songs coming out. We're all excited, Levi. Get ready. That's all I can say. Too young and we're too high not to be dumb.